Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. We are so glad that you have joined us again for the worship hour. Amen. I am Minister Gloria Pope and I am Reverend Leroy Larry Sonnet. Amen. And we are standing in the gap right now for our pastor. But we praise God for the word that this man of God is going to deliver to us today. Is it entitled, Jesus Knows All About It. So if you're sitting at home and you're wondering if God knows all about your troubles, if God knows your situation or whatever is going on in your life, the man of God is going to let you know today that Jesus knows all about it. Amen. Why don't you get ready? Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 9, mm -hmm. verse 33 through 35. Amen. Come on, saints of God. Let's go to church. Amen. Let the church say amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be here this morning. I'm so glad to be here this morning. See, I'm so glad that the bed that I laid down in last night didn't wind up being my cooling board. And the sheets that I covered up with last night didn't wind up being my winding sheets. And the four walls of the room that I slept in last night didn't become the four walls of my grave. I'm so glad this morning that he loved me one more time. That he reached down this morning with his tender finger of mercy and touched me and my eyes came open and I saw a brand new day. One that I've never seen before. One that I've never seen, I'll never see again. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad. It's another day's journey. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad about it. I'm glad about it. My Lord, my Lord, my Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My Lord, my Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This time we're going to have our praise and worship this morning. We're going to start off by hearing some selections by our choir. Amen. Let's, let's, let's help them. Let's, let's praise the Lord with them this morning. Let's praise the Lord with them this morning.
So give God the highest praise and all the genius boys and all the so hard to see it it took me so long to believe it that you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what we don't deserve and you take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won, <clears throat> I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence, I'm seated In the heavenly place undefeated With the one who has conquered it all Now I can finally see it You're teaching me how to receive it to let all the striving cease This is my victory Cause you are my champion Giants fall when you stand undefeated Every battle you won I am who you say I am you crown me with confidence, I'm seated In the heavenly place undefeated With the one who has conquered it all Oh, with the one who has conquered it all My voice 
and shout Every wall comes crashing down I have the authority Jesus has given me When I open up my mouth Miracles start breaking out I have the authority Jesus has given me When I lift my voice and shout Every wall comes crashing down I have the authority Jesus has given me You are my champion Giants fall when you stand undefeated Every battle you won I am who you say I am You crown me with confidence I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all you are my champion giants fall when you stand undefeated every battle you won i am who you say i am you crown me with confidence, I am seated In the heavenly place undefeated With the one who has conquered it all champion giants fall when you stand undefeated every battle you won i am who you say i am you crown me with confidence i'm seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all you are my champion giants fall when you stand undefeated every battle you won i am who you say i am you crown me with confidence i'm seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all undefeated with the one who has conquered it all hallelujah glory hallelujah 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. How many of you are ready for the word? I don't know about you, but I am. The Bible says something, some things about the word. There's power in the word of the Lord. There's power. There's soul saving power. There's healing power. There's the power of salvation in the word. You can't beat the word. How many of you are ready for the word? I am. Would you go with me to the mercy seat in prayer? Father God, we, we come to you this morning in the best way that we know how. Our heads are already bowed and our hearts are contrite. Father, we want to thank you this morning for allowing us one more time to assemble in this place called sanctuary to hear a word from you now father what I, I i'm asking you to do something for me this morning i'm asking you to give me preaching power this morning the power that makes preaching easy this morning father i want you to allow me to lean on you this morning I, 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 I want you to, to, to let me lean on you, Father. I, I want you to, uh, to allow me to decrease. I want to decrease, Father, so you can increase this morning. Father, I pray that some shackles are broken this morning. Father, I pray that some chains are broken this morning. Father, I pray that some hearts will, and souls and minds will be convicted this morning. And Father, I pray that the light of your word will penetrate the darkness in somebody's mind this morning. And Father, we'll be able and all, be ever mindful to give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. In the marvelous, majestic name of the Master, we pray. And let everybody say amen. 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 Those of you who are able, would you stand for the reading of God's word? I'm so glad this morning. I'm so happy. Allow me to draw your attention to the book of Mark, the ninth chapter, beginning with the 33rd verse. Mark 9, 33. And when you get it, would you signify by saying amen? Amen. Those who need to, for me to wait a minute, say, wait a minute, preacher. I don't mind waiting on the Lord. And the word of the Lord reads on this wise. And he came to Capernaum and being in the house, he asked them, what was that ye disputed among yourselves, by the way? But they held their peace. For by the way, they had disputed among themselves. Who should be the greatest? And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our almighty God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. 
May God sanctify the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. Sometimes, you know, people have the, the tendency to think that preaching is easy. That we get behind the pulpit and just preach. But sometimes, you know, uh, we come into, when I say we, I'm speaking about us preachers. Sometimes we come into conflict with what God wants us to do. What I mean by that, sometimes we have a message that we want to preach. And God said, oh, no. That's not what I want you to preach. Now, if you preach it, you're preaching it on your own. But I want you to preach this word. And then sometimes we say, well, Lord, are you sure? Lord, I don't know if you be looking at them folks when we be standing up preaching. See, we can see every one of them. Look like they be doing this. <laughs> but okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going to do exactly what you told me to do. So this morning, I would like to preach to us from the topic, Jesus knows all about it. Let me say that again. Jesus knows all about it. In this thing called life, I'm quite sure that I can make this statement without fear of successful contradiction, that we find ourselves in places and, and, and in mindsets that do not reflect our belief, that does not reflect our Christianity. Sometimes we find ourselves in those situations. When the winds of adversity blow against us sometimes, when we find ourselves in circumstances that take us out of our comfort zones, when we experience the uh, vicissitudes of life, we sometimes have a tendency to want to question God. Lord, uh, do you really uh, know what's going on with me right now? Father, uh, what's going on? Right? Uh, I, you seem like you're, you're not moving. Or do you hear my prayers? Are, you, are my prayers getting to you? Mm -hmm. When life turns upside down and we can't turn it right side up, it's, uh, it's natural sometimes to wonder if Jesus cares about you and your circumstance. It just happens. And if you find yourself in one of those moments, you know WWJD. What would Jesus do? Then I know you've wondered if Jesus knew all about it. When we slip and slide, I say when we slip and slide into sin, it's natural for a Christian to wonder if Jesus is paying attention. We like to say or sing the song, Jesus knows all about it. But if we were honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that there are some things we wish we could conceal from Christ. But Jesus knows all about it. That debt that we refuse to pay. That relationship we refuse to accept. That guilt we refuse to confess. The tongue that we refuse to control. That lust we refuse to constrain. That bottle we refuse to put down. That affair we refuse to end. That tithe we refuse to pay. 
That language we refuse to clean up. That gossip we shouldn't have listened to and repeated. That magazine that we should have put down. That rap music that we should have turned off. That neighbor that we refuse to help. That trouble we should have steered clear of. Did I leave out anything? Well, if I did, Jesus knows all about it. In our text today, Jesus and his disciples have just arrived in Capernaum. They no sooner get settled when Jesus asked them an all important question. What were you guys arguing about when you, think, when you thought that I didn't hear you? On, on the way here, what were you guys arguing about on the, the road? It's hard to believe that anyone would dare argue about anything in the presence of Jesus. How could they do that? But I guess human nature has a way of surfacing even in a holy environment. You know what I mean? That unkind remark at choir practice. That snicker over the pastor's message. That gossip spread admission meeting. That criticism voiced at church business meeting. That judgmental attitude toward a new member. You told me to do it, Lord. <laughs> Most of the time, we catch ourselves, but sometimes things just have a way of slipping out. So I guess we should give the disciples the benefit of the doubt and say that they were just caught off guard by the overwhelming temptation that was before them. And what was that temptation? It was the temptation to be the greatest disciple. The disciples were having a Muhammad Ali moment, arguing among themselves about who is the greatest. I am. The greatest. Yes. And staying like a bee, the hands can't hit what the eyes can see. I'm so fast that I turn the light switch off. Get in the bed and be asleep before the room get dark. I am the greatest. The disciples were having one of those moments. Arguing about who was the greatest. One thing, let me, let me digress for a moment. Allow me to put my spiritual kickstand down. One thing I like about our pastor, uh, the Reverend John Scott Pope Jr., is that he refuses to let anybody worship him. And our first lady, uh, first lady, Minister Gloria Pope, no, I'm not going to say that. Minister Gloria Wife Hope. She refuses to let anybody worship her. I remember a pastor said one time, and we were talking, and he said, I'm not going to be walking around like Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what praise a uh, 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 human, uh, people worshiping, that's what it gets you. But these uh, disciples were arguing about who was the greatest. And, and you'd be surprised the mindset of some of the people in the church. People that have been in the church for over 60, 70 years, 30, 40, 50 years, they will get mad at you. They'll get mad at the preacher if you don't call their name. They will stop speaking to somebody that doesn't call their name during the church service, acknowledging something that they, uh, that they did. See, there's nothing spiritual, nothing holy about that. And that's what, what Jesus was telling his disciples. What were you guys arguing about? Like, I don't know, but I, don't, I, want, to, I want to hear from you. Was it Peter who Jesus called the rock? Was it John who loved Jesus more than anyone? Was it Luke who offered free physician services? Was it Matthew who had a connection to the Roman treasury department? Was it Mark 
who uh, had an end with the Jews? Was it Judas who held the purse strings? As soon as they got to their destination house at Capernaum, verse 34 says that Jesus asked the question, what were you guys arguing about while we were on the open road? And the disciples clammed up. The Bible says that they held their peace. Uh -huh. The brief account of this Capernaum visit gives us some insight into the mindset of the disciples and the mindset of Jesus at the time, this stage of their walk with their new rabbi. This short record tells us three things. First, the disciples had not yet developed strong faith. At this time, they had not developed strong faith. Now, let me tell you how important that is. The book of Hebrews tells us about faith, what it is. You say it is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's what the scripture says. And then one day, the, 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 the Bible tells me that, that, that Jesus went to Peter and he said, Peter, Satan has asked for you. He's asked me for you, right? And in, in my mind, I don't know if he was asking for the same reason that he asked uh, God for, 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 for Job. But he says that he has asked for you. He says, so he, he, he wants to sift you as wheat. Hey, but don't worry, Peter, because I have prayed for you. But this is what I prayed for, that your faith don't fail. My brothers and sisters, before I proceed, let me remind you of this. And if you don't hear nothing else that I say this morning, please, please hear this. See, even Satan knows, Satan knows this, that it is impossible to please God without faith. That's an impossibility. The scripture says that it's impossible to please God without faith. And he knows that when your faith is gone, you're easy pickings. You're easy prey now. At least some of the disciples must have wondered how in the world did Jesus know about the argument that they were having on the road to Capernaum. After all, they, they thought that they were being discreet and careful. They thought that they had taken every precaution not to be within the earshot of, uh, of their master. Otherwise, they would have waited until uh, Jesus had laid down to go to sleep or went off to pray. Then they would have had the argument had they been thinking. It wouldn't be long before the disciples got a real life lesson on the work of ministry. When Peter, James, and John came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and joined the other disciples, a man came to them with a prayer request for a lunatic son whom he said was sorely vexed. He told Jesus that he brought his son to the disciples for a cure, but they could not cure him. Mm -hmm. Jesus cited them for their weakness, calling them a faithless and a perverse generation. That's what he called his disciples. A, 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 uh, a, a, a faithless and perverse generation. Then he rebuked the devil, and the Bible says that the child was cured in that same hour. The disciples came to their teacher and said, why couldn't we do that, Lord? Jesus said, it's your unbelief that's the stumbling block. Let me say that again. It's your unbelief that was your stumbling block. Let me add this in here. When we have financial difficulties, when we have other things, the, the, the wind of, of adversity blows against us. And we go walking a trail in our carpet at home. We forget about that we serve a God that neither slumbers nor sleeps. And if that be the truth, it don't make no sense for both of us to stay woke. So you should go to bed if you really believe. And when you don't, that means that your faith it has become weak. 
He says it takes prayer and fasting to develop your faith. Like it takes push-ups, uh, pull-ups, uh, barbell, barbell uh, 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 bench presses, and, 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 and dumbbell curls, you know, to uh, develop muscles. It takes fasting and prayer to develop your faith. Can somebody say amen this morning? But, and that, that has to happen before you'll be able to perform miracles. Amen. I know I'm paraphrasing, but Jesus made it clear that faith is the key. It's the substance of all that we hope for. What the disciples were lacking, Jesus said, was faith the size of a mustard seed. Probably when he heard that, probably some of them were, might felt insulted. The mustard seed was the tiniest of seeds. Surely they had least that much faith. Weren't they following Jesus at their own peril? It was dangerous in those times to follow Jesus, just like it is today. See, it's dangerous to follow Jesus whether you know it or not. Uh -huh. You can wear the name, but when you start following Jesus, well, you put yourself in a precarious situation. Uh-huh. But uh, to understand this parable, we need to understand how the mustard seed grows. It may be the tiniest of seeds, the size of a pinhead. Uh -huh. But the, by the time it breaks through the ground, that stalk has already developed a vast root system that will sustain it even through desert droughts. Jesus was comparing the growth of the mustard seed Within the spirit, with the spiritual growth of his disciples. They needed a deep root system of faith to prepare them to conquer all circumstances, to defeat all discouragement, to overcome all opposition, to face all fears, to defy all devils, and to withstand all of the storms. Second, we learn their desire to be greatest was not godly. Let me say that one more time. We learn that their desire to be the greatest was not godly. The disciples must have known this. Why else would they have held their peace when Jesus asked them what they were arguing about? They knew they were doing something wrong. Uh -huh. They were convicted. At the very moment Jesus posed his question, the disciples were ashamed of their arguing. How ridiculous to think that Jesus had a favorite. Every disciple would be important uh, to the work of the ministry. You know, you have to trust somebody. And I, this, this just came to me. You have to trust somebody to trust them with your money. To take all the money out of your pocket and give it to this person and say, hey, you're in charge of the money. And guess who had the money with the disciples? Judas was the one. He was the, he was the treasurer. He, he, Judas kept all of the money. He even had a, a place in the order of things. And it was ridiculous for any of them to think that uh, Jesus had a favorite. Peter had to anchor the body of Christ in Jerusalem. John would ultimately write the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos. Thomas would spread the gospel in southern India. Andrew would preach to the Scythians and the, and the Tracians. James, the son of Zebedee, and James, the son of Alphaeus, would both preach to the early converts at Rome. Philip would preach to the Greeks, the Syrians, and the Phygerians. Nathaniel would preach to the Muslims in northern India. Matthew would preach uh, throughout Ethiopia. Thaddeus would preach to Mesopotamia, Syria, Arabia, and Odessa. Simon the Canaanite would preach in Egypt, Cyrene, Africa, Mauritania, Britain, Libya, and Persia. 
only Judas would betray Jesus. Every disciple will have a critical role to play in the spread of the gospel. So why would Jesus need to pick the greatest among them? Such foolishness was carnal, not spiritual. The disciples tried to avoid Jesus' question to hide the truth of their argument. But we learn that Jesus knew all about it anyway. Our text says that he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, the servant of all. Right there, Jesus put an end to their debate with a one sentence life lesson. If you want to be first, be last. Don't seek to lead, but rather seek to serve. In other words, lead from the rear. Our human nature gets in the way sometimes of genuine Christian service. Sometimes, or a lot of times, most times, we want to do the right thing. But our human nature sometimes gets in the way of us doing that. And the reason why is that our human nature responds to flattery. Our human nature is motivated by power and prestige. Our human nature is provoked by position rather than purpose. It is driven by earthly rewards rather than heavenly honor. In contrast, Christian service is selfless and often without earthly rewards. It does not seek to be front runner or the trailblazer. True Christian service does not seek to manage or spearhead the spread of the gospel, but to do it one saved soul at a time. And if a Christian is chosen to lead, it is by virtue of his or her humility. Leadership sought in any other way is not Christian leadership. It is flawed at best. As I prepare to go to my seat, because I was given instructions this morning, uh, well, yesterday evening, and I remember what my grandmother said. She said, son, you're kind of long-winded. She said, don't make the people happy twice. So I promised that I would not keep you long, and I am not a lying prophet, so I will not keep you long. But before I retire to my seat, I would like for you to know that uh, you, you know, I know you've been, you've been working a long time for the Lord, but Jesus knows all about it. He knows about your burdens. That's why he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus knows all about it. He knows about your financial condition. That's why he said, wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, all ye of little faith? Jesus knows all about it. Jesus knows all the way. He knows about your fears. That's why he said, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. He says that, he says that, 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 uh, 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 uh that, you know, that, that it, it comes, it, it might last for a night. Weeping, but joy comes in the morning. That's what he said. He knows all about it. Jesus knows about it. He knows about your sorrow. That's why he said your sorrow shall be turned into joy. He said that he would keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Jesus knows all about it. He knows about your persecution. That's why he said every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right side, right cheek, turn to him the other also. Jesus knows all about it. He knows about your virtues and he knows about your vices. He knows about our sins and our sincere confessions. 
Jesus knows about our wicked ways and our quest for decency. He knows who is righteous and he knows who is unrighteous. He knows about our faith. He knows about our foolishness. He knows what's in our heads and he knows what's in our heart. Jesus knows all about it. You know why? Because Jesus knows all about us. He knows. We serve a on time God. Like God like none of these God all by himself. And I'm so glad that I can call him in the morning. And I can call him in the evening. And I can call him when the sun goes down. He's a mother to the motherless. He's a father when father's gone. He's a friend that will stick closer than a brother. He will dry your weeping eyes. He will make a way when there is no way. We serve an own time God. And I'm so glad that he loved me when I couldn't love myself. He loved me despite of me. And I'm glad about it. May God bless you. Thank everybody who came this morning to share in this message. We pray that somebody heard something that would be life changing for them. And I said previously, I pray that some shackle will be broken this morning. Some chain will be broken. Some prison doors will come open. Some souls and minds and hearts will be convicted. That someone leave better than they came. And we'll be ever mindful to give all the glory and honor to God. So, join me in prayer, please. Okay, most, most definitely. Let us pray for our pastor. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in the best way that we know how with bowed heads and humble hearts. Hearts full of love, thanksgiving, and praise. Father, we just want to say thank you for sharing um, Reverend John Scott Pope Jr. with us. As the man servant that you have placed uh, here as under shepherd over your flock. Father, we want to thank you for the, the help meet that you have placed by his side. Minister Gloria Pope. Father, we pray right now that you uh, hold both of them in the hollow of your hands. Keep them in the center of your will. Encamp your protective angels around both of them by day and by night. And protect them from all hurt, harm, and danger, seen and unseen. Father, right now, we ask that you touch the body of our pastor right now. We speak restoration into his body right now. We speak wholeness into his body right now. We speak wellness into his body right now. And Father, we're not hoping, we're not hoping for anything. Father, we're expecting these things to come to pass. Because Father, you said that if we ask it in your name, Father, you said that you would give it to us in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to hear a word from you. Father, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. We thank you for the visitors that came to visit with us today here in the sanctuary and those that were visiting through uh, digital land. We just want to say thank you. And now may the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest rule and abide with us now and forevermore. Let everyone say amen. 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 You are now excused. Hallelujah. We're living in a time sometimes with everything that is going on, Reverend, that we can wonder if God knows all about what is happening to us in this world. When the winds of adversity seems to be blowing against us and 
we find ourselves facing the vicissitudes of what's going on in the world, sometimes we have a tendency to question God. Yes. But I want to let you know that God knows all about it. Amen. He knows all about it and he cares for you. He loves you. Amen. And that is something that we can take comfort in knowing that he knows. We just have to make sure that we develop our faith. Amen. Because I believe you told us that without faith, it is impossible, impossible. to please God. Amen. And it is so good to know that. But with that faith, we have to understand that Jesus knows all about it. So all we want to thank it. you for joining us for the worship hour. But you can join us for ch our church service, our worship service at 10 o'clock, our Sunday school at 9 o'clock a.m. And then you can join us at 6.15 on Wednesday night for Bible study. We're, we're so thankful that you came to join thank us today. Thank you so much. We want to thank the man of God for ministering the word of God to us. And Praise we will God. see you the next time on the worship hour.